My life was fine without you. I was covering up secret tears. I cried. Then one day, someone told me of your mercy and the love you showed on a hill called Calvary. There you died and purchased my redemption. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you at Gospel Light Baptist Church. What a beautiful day it is to be in God's house. We're going to begin our service by singing a chorus that should be familiar to us all as a church family. Uh, let's join in standing and sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. no family like the family of God. Amen. And I'm thankful that you're here this morning. Wonderful, wonderful singing. How many of you, you think that it couldn't have been a more better day than today with the yes. weather the way it is, wow. the sun shining? I mean, it is wonderful and we ought to thank the Lord for it. Bible says what? This is the day that the Lord hath made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So take advantage in the evening. Last night I sat outside in my, on my porch area in the backyard and my son opened the door and he's like, Dad, what are you doing out here? And I said, I'm getting away from you. No, that's not what I said. Now, some of you parents, you're like, I did that with my children. Don't worry. But I said, I just got to enjoy the beautiful, beautiful weather that God has given to us. And uh, it is just an encouragement to see you here this morning. Uh, we have much to praise the Lord for, much to be thankful for. I do want to mention a couple of prayer requests. And Brother Robs, if he come to the platform at this time, he's going to open our service in prayer. But first, I wanted to mention Miss Norma Buckles. How many of you were able to pray for her this week? And uh, by God's grace and by God's mercy, she had a wonderful procedure, wow. and she was able to be uh, taken from the hospital back home. Uh, she's doing very, very well. I got a call from her daughter uh, that day that the surgery went well. They didn't have to keep her for two nights, just the one night, and uh, she's back home several of our church members and I want to say thank you to those that have contacted her and I know of others that are planning on making visits to encourage her thank you thank you so much she feels that love and support and I just want to say as your pastor thank you very much for that uh, I also want to say pray for Josh and Alicia Potter 
uh, new members here at Gospel Light Baptist Church. They're not here with us this morning. Alicia is on the verge of having her second child. Amen. And so pray for her. She is, uh, I believe the text I got this morning, if there is no baby by Wednesday, they're going to induce her. And so just be in prayer for her and maybe some of the ladies text her, encourage her. And uh, I'm just so thankful that our family is getting one person bigger. Amen. Yes. And uh, just pray for a safe delivery on that. And I know they'll appreciate it. I'll uh, pray for Donnie Vicnair. Uh, Miss Susan is here this morning. I'm thankful for that. Uh, she had a, a much, uh, a lar she had a pain in her back last week that was able, not able to allow her to be with us. And I'm thankful that she's here this morning. Amen. If you're thankful, would you say amen? amen. Yes. And uh, she is, uh, she is one year older today and all God's people amen. said. And uh, I would say one year younger, but let's sing happy birthday to her if we can. Let's go ahead and do that at this time. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And I tell you what, if you don't know Miss Susan, you need to get to know her. She is just one of those ladies that when you get around her, she is a source of encouragement. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten texts from her just saying, we're praying for you, Pastor. We love you, Pastor. Praying for your family. How's your family doing? And I know she doesn't just do it with me. I know she does it for many others, and so I'm thankful for Miss Susan. But be in prayer for her husband, Donnie, who's home in pain uh, this morning. So let's continue to pray for him. I also wanted to mention a praise. Uh, the Lord allowed me the privilege of being able to speak to uh, Sam Gonzalez, who is a brother to uh, Miss Joyce Gonzalez and Teddy Gonzalez. And uh, Sam did not know Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Um, and I know Miss Joyce and him had been conversing back and forth through the pandemic. Uh, how many understand during this pandemic, alcohol is on the rise, uh, drug use is on the rise, crime is on the rise, but also depression is on the rise. And uh, Sam was suffering from that. He lives in North Carolina, the Jacksonville area and uh, lives by himself and uh, you know just really been struggling and Miss Joyce has been praying and several others have been praying for his salvation and uh, how many understand when God enters the conversation yes. everything around it can change Amen. and it's not anything to do with us it is everything to do with the Lord and uh, I'm pleased to inform you that this week Sam prayed and trust the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. as a Savior I want you to pray for Sam because uh, Sam needs a local New Testament church to be a part of as well and so we're trying to get in contact with several ministries in that area to try to encourage him but uh, he was able to call Joyce that day and uh, he was able to say to Joyce I got it settled I know that I'm on my way to heaven that my sins are Amen. forgiven wow. and what a wonderful encouragement that is uh, the final thing I want to mention by way of prayer is pray for our president and first lady yep. um, I know you know it's just it's amazing how people's hearts and critical spirits are coming out these days even with something like this and the president and first lady getting sick and people are just like well it's his own fault well it's this or that and on and on the list and we just need to pray for our president yeah. uh, this is not a time to more divide and push political agendas it's more to unite our people and uh, so I'm gonna ask brother Robs if he would pray uh, for that as well uh, he's also gonna come and give you an update each and every week we want to give you an update of how our bus ministry is doing and so brother Robs you come at this time I've given him much to pray over uh, he does have a list don't worry but uh, he's gonna give you an update with our bus ministry and then pray real quick we had 18 this morning on the bus Amen. on the buses yeah, that came good. in, and uh, God God really blessed them. We, we were blessed, and we had two we have two visitors, Miss Van Sh Van Shannon Amen. and her daughter Amen. Paris. Amen. They came with us on the bus this morning. Thankful that they're here, and um, if you could help, we're gonna we're gonna work on starting to have a um, a uh, what's the word? I don't know. Rotation. No. <laughs> what's the thing? The shop store. Store, that's the word. We're gonna start, have, we're, we're gonna work on having a store for the kids, but we need your help. Oh, yeah. we're, gonna ha we're gonna reward them for sitting good in church, but we'd like for you to bring in like dollar stuff or maybe like go to the five and under store, five, five bucks and under store or whatever, and get something that a kid would like. We're gonna have them, we're gonna reward them, but they're gonna have to earn, they're not just gonna get this stuff. They're gonna have to sit still and like once a month or once a quarter, we're gonna have a little, a little thing that's but I, I don't want to just but that's every week we're going to give you a little update on on the bus ministry and I'm going to try to remember I'm going to try to write it down more than I did this week and not have asked brother Tyler for a word that I can't remember let's pray 
Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Father, for how good you are to us. Thank you for Sunday morning when we can get together with the family and worship around your word. Yes. Lord, I thank you for gospel light. And Lord, I thank you for what she stands for. That's, that's above, and, uh, above and beyond everything else. She stands for what's right, and she stands for your word. And she, w w she, Your word never changes. I thank you for the way that you love us. Lord, I thank you for the, the, um, the good report from Ms. Norma Buckle's recovery. Please continue working in her life, and please continue healing her up, Lord, and please, we sure do miss, love Miss Norma, and we love her, and we miss her. Continue to heal her and help her bring her back to church. Be with Miss Alicia Potter as she's nearing the, the birth of the baby. I know that these last few days are really frustrating, and with the baby, there's so many things that could happen. Thank you that they're, thank you that you're in, in control, Lord. I pray that you would just give them, give her grace, and Help her through this time and help Brother Josh, help him to be the support that he needs to be also. Lord, I, I pray for Brother Donnie that he's in pain this morning, that he had that he had an injury this past week. I pray that you would heal him up and Lord, please let him, please put your arms around him. Let him know that we love him and that, that, he's, that you love him also, Lord. I, I thank you that you're the God that knows everything that, that happens. Yeah, yeah. Lord Jesus, I thank you that this past week, Brother Tyler got to talk to Brother Sam Gonzalez and yeah. Thank you that he, he accepts you as, as your own, as his savior. Thank you, Lord, that there's nothing, nothing now that, that can keep him from going to heaven. That it, it's, it's a free gift and all you have to do is accept it. And thank you, thank you for your free gift of salvation for me. Lord, I pray that you would be with our president and please heal him up and bring him back. And Lord, like Brother Tyler said, our country doesn't need more politics. We need, we need to unite and we need our, our country to be more of a, more back to, the way that she she used to be around your word and centered on the Bible and centered on different things. Now, as we get into the service this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would bless everything that's said and done. Lord, if there's one here that does this morning that doesn't know you, help them to join the list with yes. Brother Sam Gonzalez. Yes. Lord, don't let them leave here without accepting you as their own personal Savior. Thank you for the many things you'll do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's stand once again as we sing uh, Only a Sinner, hymn number 208. If you want to follow along in your hymn books, we're going to sing the first and the last of hymn 207, Only a Sinner.
Christ. Now, if you can join Brother Sam in saying this this morning, we are only a sinner saved by grace. I want to hear you sing out on this last verse. All right, here we go. How many would echo like the Apostle Paul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I'm thankful this morning that his grace is greater than all of our sin. You may be seated. Let me welcome you to our service again. Those that are visiting with us today, let me extend a special warm welcome to you and say thank you. Uh, we are so glad that you've decided to join us this morning. Uh, one way you can help us is by filling out that connection card that you probably already received in your gift bag. Uh, if you did not, there's one there in the pew in front of you, and we'd be happy to connect with you in the days ahead. Uh, how many of you think the fall decorations look great? Great. And uh, the person that's responsible for that is Mark Miet. Let's give him a round of applause this morning. And Mark did a great job with those. And, uh, you know, our church was depleted in the stash of uh, fall decorations. And Mark said, Brother Pastor Scott, I got tons of decorations. And I don't know about you, but he has outdone himself. And I'm so thankful for the fall decorations. And uh, if the temperatures would stay colder and colder, that would be a blessing as well. But uh, some of you, how many of you like the warm weather? Would you raise your hand? How many of the cold people? You like the cold? Amen. Hey, pretty good. All right. I think we are officially a house divided this morning. No, uh, that's not the church. Of the living God. But anyway, uh, let me give you a couple of announcements. First, our midweek service is this Wednesday, 6 30. Uh, we had such a wonderful time in the month of September going through God Is, and it was just a wonderful sermon series. Let me encourage you if you ever miss a service, if you ever miss a message, just know you don't have to miss those messages. You don't have to miss those services. We have put such a massive library together. On our website alone, we have over 700 messages. Uh, we have those dating back, I believe, all the way to 2016, if I'm not mistaken. And so we have them all from there all the way until now. So if you go to glbcbr.com forward slash sermons, every single one of the most recent ones, every single one of you usually have a bulletin insert with a handout. Every single one of those messages has attached a handout for you to follow along if you miss a service so you can stay on top with that. You go to our Facebook page, Facebook Live, we stream every single service um, uh, Sunday uh, and Wednesday as well so you can stay connected with that and uh, it is just a tremendous blessing. This Wednesday, however, we're going to take our, our Ephesians series and we're going to move that to Wednesday. Um, my wife and I, if you pray for us, Thursday we'll be going to the north. We'll be going to Michigan. Uh, we had plans to go in April, or actually my, my mom was planning on coming down for Emma's birthday, uh, but how many understand there was a thing called COVID that got in the middle of that? And so anyway, she uh, and I were talking not too long after we had to cancel the flight, and she said, well, why don't y'all come up to Michigan? And my wife, were my wife, wife and I were talking, and in all the years that my wife and I have been together, she's never been up to Michigan to see the fall season. Uh, we've always been up there for Christmas. We've been up there for summer. But how many have ever been up north and seen the change of the leaves? And it is just beautiful. And so pray for us. Thursday, we'll be flying out to Detroit, and uh, we'll be spending some time up there. Uh, my dad got whiff, of course, that I was coming up. Pray for me. I'm actually going to be preaching that Friday night. So I get in Thursday. Friday, I'm going to be preaching for their Reformers Unanimous Faith-Based Addictions Program. And uh, I, I'm just super excited for the opportunity. And I, I told my dad, I said, you know, Dad, I want I want you to come down and I want you to preach at our ministry here because there's not there's not too many uh, pastors and pulpits today that could say that their their dad was able to come and preach at their church and so I I invite that opportunity I'm hoping that can
can that that can happen in the days ahead. But uh, just pray for us as we're up there. We have a great uh, set of speakers that will be preaching while I'm gone, and I'm looking forward to uh, watching by way of live stream and receiving those encouraging messages. So let me encourage you be in your place uh, here over the next couple of weeks. Also, October 24th is our fall festival event. I'm telling you, a lot of places are canceling or are panicking about trick-or-treating and everything like that. And I'm pleased to inform you that we're going to have an event here at our church so that if people are not able to get out and trick-or-treat, we can say, hello, we're having an event here at our church. And how many of you think if we get them here, we just give them the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so pray for us. There is a sign-up sheet on the podium there in the back. There's about 11 to 12 games. We cannot do this event without our church. We just can't. And so let me encourage you, church family. Uh, well, I don't normally get involved. I don't normally do this. Let me, let me just encourage you. Get involved in this event. It'll be a tremendous help. Uh, we don't want people to have to pull double duty on, on games. We want them to be able to enjoy it. So if you're able to get involved, let me encourage you. See that sign-up sheet in the back? Uh, we also have a box in the lobby for candy. So if you haven't gotten candy, and no, we're not giving it to the kids this morning. Uh, we are giving the candy away on the fall festival event. So if you can grab a couple of bags, bags of candy, bring them by the church. I know that'll be a tremendous blessing as well. Um, our church family was able yesterday to go over to Lake Charles, and I wanted to show you a presentation this morning of just our time over there. Uh, we've been working with Friendship Baptist Church there in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and uh, this is a member of the church there in Lake Charles, and just a sweet, kind family. It is the LeBlanc family. How many of you know that's a Cajun name right there, the LeBlanc family, or French name, I guess I should say. Uh, but anyway, we were able to go there. They have um, on their they have a double wide trailer and they had a massive handicap porch because one of their sons is in a, uh, a motorized uh, uh, a wheelchair there and so we had to pull the entire deck out uh, on the front side and on the back side as well and as you can see there's a that's just a sliver of the the deck that we pulled out you can see they're already putting all the stuff up on the road they have to assort it by way of wood plastic and as well as metal and so that's the house in the background you can see there the other thing that you see is there is a porch cover that was actually attached to the house we had to pull that off because in order for them to get that trailer off the property we had to get everything around it uh, taken off this is just some uh, spots there in the back uh, we were privileged to partner with Pastor Aaron Wido of New Iberia and Temple Baptist Church and uh, so appreciate their uh, friendship and uh, being able to do that with them together. Uh, and I can tell you this, nobody got hurt in the process with all of those nails. I was just worried that somebody was going to get a nail poked or somebody was going to fall or hurt themselves. And so that's the framing there that we took off as well. Um, and we got up on ladders and pulled that. Uh, those are the beams that were uh, cemented into the ground. And uh, the tractor was pulling all this stuff out. And so I took it upon myself to just say, you know what? I'm going to try to get these posts out by myself. And how many of you know when something's put in the ground by concrete, that's a stupid idea. Uh, and this morning, I was a little late coming into church because my alarm went off at 6.30 and my body was like, you're old. <laughs> you're sore. And I mean, my muscles were just like, oh. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I was uh, messed with by Brother Robs when I got to the property. He said, hey, Pastor Scott, can I help you with your computer bag and get it to the church this morning? Do you need me to help carry that? And I said, I'm going to reject that offer. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, this is the group that we were able to be with uh, from Temple Baptist Church. And uh, church family, I just want to say this. Not only can we be the hands and feet of Jesus here in Baton Rouge, but how many of you know we can go all over the place and be the hands and feet of Jesus as well? And uh, this, is, this is what your money is going towards. Uh, so those of you that aren't physically able to be there, thank you first off for your prayers, because without your prayers, we wouldn't be able to accomplish the thing that we were able to do. Uh, and then also your financial support. And I will say this, I was connected with one pastor in Sulphur uh, that is going through a whole lot of problems, a whole lot of difficulty. So I'm going to extend our hurricane relief giving. So if you want to give, what we're going to do is take up that offering of the hurricane relief fund. You can do so online. You can label it there on the envelope as well and we will be giving it directly to a ministry there in Sulphur. We'll be giving another one to the 
Friendship Baptist Church. We just want to be a blessing and a help because you know what? If ever that event happens here, you know what our testimony would be? That of helping them. And I know they would reciprocate that as well if ever there was an event like that. And so thank you for your prayers and for your help with that. It was a wonderful trip as well. Tonight, this is the final announcement, is our Lord's Supper service. And these have just been such a wonderful time to observe the Lord's Supper and the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It really just gets our focus back on the Lord in a great way. And so tonight, let me encourage you, be back in your place, and I know you'll receive a blessing with that. All right, those are all the announcements. Let's all stand, and we're going to take our songbooks to him. 355, sing a great song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Brother Jacob? All right, hymn number 355. Let's sing out on all three verses of this hymn. singing this morning. You may be seated. We're going to have a special, and I've got to say, I appreciate everybody who's been participating in the singing. Uh, your, the music has been a blessing to me. Your participation has been a blessing to me, and I'm looking forward to this group of ladies who's going to sing this morning for us.
stand up here. Amen. Amen. Well, how'd they do, church? Yeah, I tell you what, how many are thankful this morning that he still walks and he still talks with you and me? And uh, I'm so thankful for all the ladies that were involved in this song. Uh, this was months of practice, and they did so because they wanted to edify the body of Christ. And if you were edified by that song this morning, would you say amen? Would you join me in standing as we take our copy of the Word of God this morning in the book of Ephesians chapter number 2? And our children at this time are being dismissed for Children's Church this morning. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2 this morning. And I got to say, church, just along with Brother Jacob this morning, your participation in singing and worship, uh, I believe, has encouraged me as well. And I believe it's been honoring and pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter number 2, of course, we're in our study chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the book of Ephesians. And uh, we are coming to the end of Ephesians chapter number 2. And I got to tell you, uh, this is one of many of my favorite passages of Scripture this morning, uh, because what we seek to endeavor to speak on this morning is what is seated right in front of us this morning, the church of the living God. And how many are thankful this morning to be a part of a local New Testament church? Would you say amen? amen. And I'm so glad that you're here this morning. We're going to learn about some components to uh, the church this morning, but you're there in Ephesians chapter number two, and notice verse 19, and we'll read to the end of, of chapter number two. The Bible says, Ephesians 2, verse 19, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Let's ask God's blessing on the message this morning as we talk about the household of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and Lord, thank you already for just the wonderful time that we've had in church this morning under the worship and music uh, here at Gospel Light Baptist Church. Lord, it has been such an encouragement. It has edified me in a wonderful way. And Lord, this morning, I pray that uh, uh, by the power uh, of your spirit, Lord, that you would empty me of self, that you would fill me with your spirit. And God, that uh, we would leave this place different than when we've come in, saying it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. We are thankful this morning, God, for the church. Lord, we're thankful most of all that you gave yourself for the church through your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, if there be one here today that does not know or has never had a time and a place that they have personally prayed and trusted you as their Lord and personal Savior, God, I pray today before it's eternally too late that they would pray and trust you as their Lord and personal Savior. And God, for the Christian this morning, would we walk away from the service uh, encouraged, edified, and challenged and our perspective changed on the importance of the church and how it is living, alive, and is active. Lord, we love you and praise you. Bless this time as only you can. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, really, Ephesians chapter number 2 is talking about our new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, i got to stop and ask you this. How many are thankful that new life in Jesus Christ still is an existing act of God through salvation, even in 2020, would you say amen? Uh, we had Sam Gonzalez this week that experienced new life in the Lord Jesus Christ through salvation. And as you look at chapter number two, I want you to look at it, if you would, with me. You could really divide chapter number two of Ephesians in these two thoughts. The first half of Ephesians really it speaks about our unity with Christ. When somebody is separated by sin and then by salvation, by grace through faith, they are united with the Lord Jesus Christ. You could really take the second half of chapter number two and you could speak to believers talking about our collective unity in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible speaks in Ephesians 2 and look 
look at verse 2 talking about our uh, uh, unity with Christ because we were without Christ. It says in verse 2, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, but God. Would you say that with me, church? But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. And then it says in verse number 12, that at that time ye were, this is our life before Christ, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, if we just stopped right there and said, that's the end of the Bible, how many of you know, that'd be a pretty depressing verse right there, that we are without hope, without God in this world. But look at verse number 13 and say the next two words with me. Ready? Begin. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. How I thank the Lord and how you ought to thank the Lord this morning that he saved our hell deserving soul. We were on our way to a place called hell and by God's grace he saved us and he changed us. And to think your status before Christ was this, hopeless. And now because you are in Christ, we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a wonderful contrast. And the great thing about salvation is not only do we have peace and not only do we have unity with God, but the Bible speaks of having unity and peace with one another. Now, how many understand Jesus died for all? Would you say amen this morning? He didn't miss a solitary nationality. He didn't miss a solitary culture. He died for all. And as we unpack chapter number two, if you look at verses 11 through verse number 13, we see that there was a division that was going on in first century. There was the Jews of God's chosen people, and then there were the Gentiles. There was division. And I'm pleased to inform you the beautiful picture about the cross is that those who come and trust him by faith immediately are united in fellowship with any person that names the name of Christ. How many are thankful you're a part of the family of God this morning? Would you say amen? There's not a cultural difference in this room if you're saved. There's not a racial difference in this room if you're saved. There is not a background difference if you are saved. We are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture of the household of God. You notice in this passage in verse 14 all the way to verse Verse 22, there is a word that is repeated throughout the scripture, and it's this word one. Would you say that with me? One. Because how many understand? God didn't come to this earth, bleed and died on an old rugged cross for there to be two bodies of Christ. He established one body of Christ. Notice if you would at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Verse 14 speaks of the peace that's established between the Jew and the Gentile, and he says, For he is our peace, who hath made both, what's the next word, church? One, and hath broken down the wall of partition, the barriers that divided. He broke them down between us. And then the Bible says, look at verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So we're all a part of one body. And you know what? The reason we're all a part of one body and the reason we are one this morning is because if we're saved, we have one Holy Spirit that lives inside all of us this morning. Notice in verse number 18, Ephesians 2 verse 18. He says, for through him, that's Jesus Christ, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And today we come to the, uh, uh, the end of Ephesians chapter number two. And can I tell you this morning, we are going to unpack the greatest instituted organization that God has created, and that is his church. The greatest organization that has ever been established on this earth has been the church of the living God. And here's the thing, the church was not established to create more division. The church was established to create unity amongst the people of God. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter number 2, go back to verse number 14 and we'll read through verse 16 again. Notice this word one, it's repeated over and over. He says, for he is our peace, who hath made both, say the next word, one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, that means two, what's the next word, church? 
one, one new man, so making peace. And then if you go to verse number uh, 18, the Bible says that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, for through him we both have access by what church? One spirit unto the Father. What an amazing, amazing organization that has been brought about by an act of God. And so this morning, what I want to talk about is I want to talk to you about what makes the church so great. How many are pretty biased this morning? You think Gospel Light is pretty great. Uh, I'm pretty biased. Gospel Light is the best church on the planet, okay? Uh, but I'm telling you, what makes the church of the living God so amazing and so great and why you and I ought to want to be a part of it? Notice if you're taking notes this morning, number one, the citizens. The citizens. Notice in our text, verse number 19, we're just going to walk verse by verse through verses 19 through verse 22. But the Bible says in verse 19, it says, now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but, and say the next word nice and loud with me this morning, church. Ready, begin. Fellow citizens. You see, apart from God himself, the best thing about the church is the people. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to have God's presence this morning. Would you say amen? But I'm thankful this morning that there are people in the pew. Uh, it would be pretty challenging for me to preach this morning if nobody was here. Now, we would still preach and the service would still go on, but I'm thankful this morning that the church is so wonderful, not just because of God and we thank Him for it, but because of the people, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a place, the church is a place where division shouldn't be created. It should be squelched, where unity should be created. And I'm going to tell you, the purpose of the church is twofold. Notice, if you would, this morning, letter A about the citizens. It is a purpose of identity. Letter A, I want you to notice the citizens, the, the purpose of the church and people coming is it is a purpose of identity. Notice what it says in verse 19. It says, now therefore... Ye are no more strangers. Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. How many understand this morning that sin divides everything? Would you agree with me on that? But how many understand Jesus Christ unites everything? Would you say amen? He unites everything. And you and I, we can't help but look at this world and see all the sin and all the division. And it's not a political problem. It's not a cultural problem. The division in our world is simple. It is a sin problem. It is a sin problem. It's not politicians. It's not anything else. It is our sin that divides. But what God's design is for the church is that uh, this would be a place where people could come and realize that at the door, all the categories are gone. We are all one in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 19, it says, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Galatians 3 verse 28 says it this way, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Jesus Christ. Now listen, when it comes to citizenship this morning, I'm thankful that I am a citizen of the United States of America, and if you are as well, would you say amen? amen. But listen to me very closely. Realize that God's purpose of identification for the church wasn't citizenship in this country. Our identification is citizenship that is in a far better country. Our citizenship first and foremost before we are an American we are a born again child of God our citizenship our identity is not in this earth it is in heaven Philippians 3 verse 20 says for our conversation that means our citizenship for our citizenship is in heaven from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I got to give you a wonderful passage to turn to this morning. Take your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, while you're turning there, anybody know what Hebrews chapter 11 has been called or notoriously been called in our Bible? Anybody know it's called the what chapter? 
the faith chapter or the hall of faith. And the Bible speaks of individuals by faith, this by faith, this, by faith. And we see a wonderful set of verses that goes to show that our identity, even from Abraham in the very beginning of the nation of Israel, he wasn't seeking a, a, a company here on this earth. He was seeking a country far better than that. Notice Hebrews 11. Look at verse number 13. It says, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. Now listen, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims, where church? On the earth. How many heard the song, this world is not my home, I'm just what? Passing through. My treasures are not here, my treasures are laid up. Notice what the Bible goes on to say. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. So those individuals that are saved that say, hey, this world's not my home. I'm passing through. An unsaved person says, well, where are you looking to? Well, they're seeking plainly a country. And notice what it says. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Listen to me. How many know there are Christians that are laying up treasures here on this earth more than they are in heaven? And don't, don't focus on this earth. Don't return to this earthly life. Look to the heavenly life. Notice what it goes on to say. But now they desire a, what does it say, church? Better country. That is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. This place, the church of the living God, is a place where we can identify as a body of believers, not divided, but united. So we see a purpose of identity, but notice, secondly, letter B, we see a purpose of unity. The purpose of the church is identification in Christ, but how many of you think it would be miserable to come to a church that's all about division? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a part of a church that just wants to create more divisions, more cliques. Can I use that word? How many of you know the church has been notorious for creating cliques? It's a sin, folks, and all God's people said. We're better than this group, or we're of this age, or we're of that generation. It doesn't matter. We are one in Christ. We are fellow citizens of the same country. Notice this purpose of unity in verse 19. Ephesians, back in our text, Ephesians 19, or, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, verse 19, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Notice, notice the unity that's spoken of here in verse 19. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, how many understand this morning? I really hope you do, that politicians will never bring about unity. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Politicians will never bring about unity. And what God doesn't want the church to do is he doesn't want people to treat fellow believers the same way this world treats everyone else. How many of you think we ought to love one another in this place? We ought to uh, uh, forbear one another. The church should be not only a place of identification in Christ, but it also should be a place where we can unite no matter the geographical location. Can I give you an example? Yesterday, we had the privilege of uniting with fellow believers in the Lake Charles area. Those of you that have financially given, those of you that have prayed, you in that time or in that action of praying, of giving, and of literally going and serving, you have united with the body of Christ. He says, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Don't miss this this morning. The church shouldn't be a group of people that only profess Christ. The church should be a group of people that practice Christ. We ought not just be a Christian in name only. How many agree with that? We ought to actually have our actions show that our profession matches up in that of unity. Matter of fact, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter number 4 because Paul speaks to the church at Ephesus about this importance of unity. Notice Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4, the Bible says in verse number 1, Ephesians 4 verse 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith, say the next three words, church, ye are called. Understand this morning, listen to me, 
I'm not calling you to live in a unifying way. It is God that is calling every single one of us to live in unity. And notice what it goes on to say. It says, uh, wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Now listen to this expression, church. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now here, I, I got to point, uh, no, count how many times the word one is used starting now. Notice what it says. There is one body and one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Just in those section of verses, God says unity, unity, unity. Even in the Old Testament, Psalm 133 verse 1, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what church? Unity. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the identification and the unification in the local New Testament church because of the citizens. Notice the second great part this morning about the church. Number two is the construction. How, how, can, how can this amazing organization of the church, how can it come about to be this way? Well, notice what verse 27, or verse 20 says. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, and are built. Would you say those words with me, church? And are built. And it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Can I tell you this morning that the church has never been and never will be man's idea? Would you say amen to that this morning? The church has always been God's idea. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, what does Jesus say? I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And can I tell you, Man's attempt to try to recreate what God has created will never be the exact same. How many understand man has tried to recreate and has perverted what God has intended to create? Man has even tried to pervert the church. Would, they, would that not be true? Verse 20, it shows us the building components. Notice two of them here. Letter A, we see the framers. The, the, ones that, the ones that framed the church, that really brought it about into our lives, we see it in verse number 20 where it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now you may say, Pastor Scott, it says built upon the foundation. Now don't miss this. The apostles and prophets are not the foundation of the church. They were simply used as framers. They were simply used as workers to lay the foundation. How many know the foundation this morning is not the apostles and prophets. It is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of the church. Because listen, without the apostles and prophets ministry in passing along the word of God to their generation, we wouldn't have our faith delivered to us like we do now. How I thank the Lord that as we read the Bible, there were real men used of the Lord that stood boldly to preach and proclaim the message of the gospel. I'm just telling you, in the Laodicean era of the neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, you know, people are growing fewer and fewer that will stand and preach the whole counsel of God. Would you and I as God's people, would we be those of framers that are building upon the foundation of the church? We see two groups here. Notice in your notes, you have this already there, the apostles. In verse number 20, it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, what is so important about the apostles this morning? Well, you realize the doctrines that they taught are the basis by which the church rests on this morning. The reason you have a doctrinal statement at Gospel Light Baptist Church is because of those apostles receiving the message from the Lord and preaching that and delivering that, and they were confirming the message of Christ. And you say, well, Pastor Scott, what was the message of Christ that the apostles delivered? Salvation has come to all, and all God's people said. Uh, what was used to in the Old Testament, uh, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, they were that. But now salvation has not just been an uh, uh, exclusive group, but is inclusive. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. They were to confirm the message of salvation. And get, get this, 
it wasn't for them to pat themselves on the back because the message wasn't even about them. Guess what the message of salvation centers on? A person by the name of Jesus Christ. As you study the book of Revelation, which now would be a good time to do that, I'm sure. Revelation chapter number 21, it's interesting. It talks about the new heaven and the new earth. And in Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, this is interesting. The Bible says, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So we see the apostles. They were important. But notice also in the text, we see another group called the prophets. Notice in verse 20, it says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So what was important about the prophets well, the prophets would herald the message in the Old Testament about a Messiah coming. And by the way, that Messiah has come. He has lived a perfect life. He has bled and died on an old rugged cross. His shed blood brings remission. That's what they were heralding. The Messiah was coming. In Isaiah, uh, the prophet, he says in Isaiah chapter 53, he came unto his own, and the Bible says what? His own received him not. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Can you picture people reading that and saying, who is Isaiah speaking about? He was speaking about the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Listen, if we think the apostles and prophets had a very important job, and by the way, the apostles and prophets had a very important job, to proclaim the message. Don't miss this. How much more important of a job do you and I have today in 21st century? Can I ask you a question? Will you be the reason that in your family the faith of Jesus Christ dies? I pray not. But how many know there are good Bible-believing, well-meaning Christians? That they have families now where one generation had the faith and the next generation did not get it. Hey, listen to me. I'm as serious as a heart attack when I say this. As a parent, you ought to be begging God for mercy for what's going on in our country. You ought to pray for your children because I, as a parent, am fearful because I don't know what our country is going to be like in five and ten years. And what I want to do as a father, what I want to do as a pastor is implore you and admonish you. Keep passing the message along. Because we don't know when it's going to become illegal in our country to gather, to preach, and to testify. How I thank the Lord for the framers of this construction process, but the best part, letter B, is the foundation. Notice letter B, the foundation. It says in verse number 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Not I think we would all agree this morning that the most important part of the construction process to any type of building is the foundation. The most important part of a building process is the foundation. And so if the most important part of a construction is the foundation, how many of you think the most important part of the church is Jesus Christ? It is him. He is the most important. Matter of fact, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body. Notice it doesn't say the pastor is the head of the body. How many are thankful for that? <laughs> I am doubly thankful for that this morning, that I am not the head of the church. It says that he, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Listen to me. God does, or Jesus Christ doesn't deserve a place in your life. Look here. He deserves first place in your life. He deserves, hey, he deserves to be put on the schedule before anything else in your life. Even before our jobs, even before our get-togethers, he deserves to be the foundation because guess what? If we put Jesus at the center of everything we do, everything will operate accordingly. But if we put Jesus outside and we have something else at the center, how many of you know Jesus is going to exit the scene pretty quick? You and I, would we have the foundation in our lives to be Jesus Christ? And notice this in the text. This is great. Verse 20. Jesus Christ, say the next word with me nice and loud, himself. Did you notice it didn't leave openings for anybody else to be the foundation of the church? Do you realize the apostles are not the foundation of the church? Hey, we're in Catholic country. I hope not to offend, but the Pope is not the head of the church. It is himself. 
Jesus Christ alone. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay that has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Notice this next word in verse 20. It says, Jesus Christ himself, what's the next word? Being. You say, what's so important about that? It's a present perfect tense, which, mean, which means this. He's always been the foundation of the church. He is the foundation of the church. <laughs> and he always will be the foundation of the church. And all God's people said, he will always be. Jesus Christ himself being, and then notice this expression here, the chief cornerstone. It means to be that of the preeminent uh, even in the Old Testament, the Bible would refer to the coming of Jesus Christ. He would be the rock. How many ever heard of the rock? And I'm not speaking about Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I'm speaking about the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalm 118 verse 22 says, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Because when Jesus came, did the Israelites receive Jesus as the head or did they deny Jesus as the head? They denied, they refused, and he became the headstone of the corner. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14 says it this way, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for again and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He is a stone. I'm pleased to inform you this morning, the church is doing just fine this morning. Because how many know Jesus is still the foundation? Even with a mandatory vaccine, is the church okay? Yes. Even with dirty politicians and we don't know what's going to happen in this election, is God still in control of the church? He's doing just fine. He's doing just fine. Matter of fact, many of you know the song by John Rippon in 1787. He spoke of it this way. How firm a foundation. He says, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? The best part of the church, the citizens. The great part about the church, the construction. You say, what is it all built for? Well, notice number three this morning, we see the culmination. What, is all, what does it all mean? What, what's the purpose? What is it building to? Notice number three this morning, the culmination. Verses 21 and 22, it says, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple. Man, underline that word, right? that expression, an holy temple. In the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for, underline this expression, an habitation of God through the Spirit. We see the reasons why God instituted the church. First notice letter A, it is to be a holy temple. The church isn't to be a carnal temple. How many understand there ought to be a difference in this organization than any other organization on the planet? Holiness. You know, we've gotten away from that in our churches, have we not? A holy temple. But notice, notice verse 21. We don't want to get too far away here in the verse. Notice verse 21. It says, in whom all the building. Would you say that with me? All the building. Okay, here we go. In whom all the building fitly framed together. It means different parts. How many know in, in 1 Corinthians it says there are many members of the body, but we are one in Jesus Christ. It says all the building fitly framed together. By the way, the only one that could frame the building correctly is Jesus Christ. The only one that could bring somebody from a background of drugs and alcohol, bring them into a church, save their soul, change their life, to bring somebody from a good background, from a good home, and bring them under the saving knowledge of the truth, and to bring them in as brother or brother or sister and sister in Christ. Only God can do that. Fitly joined together. You ever built something before and said, oh, that doesn't fit? <laughs> brother Jeff, you ever had that before? Ah, oh, it doesn't fit. Tim, you ever done that before as a carpenter? Ah, oh, that doesn't work. That doesn't fit. Measurement's off or this is off. How many understand with God when he builds his church, nothing's off at all? It's all fitly framed together. And God is the one that brings it all. And here we see the expectation in verse 21 that we are to be a holy 
temple. This is not a suggestion. This is a command that we are to be holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. If you know the verse, you can say it with me. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. It is to be a holy temple, but ultimately, let her be, it is to be an habitation of God. An habitation of God. Remember that song that we sang this morning, or the ladies, how, how many enjoyed that special this morning? Okay. Do you notice the words of that song? And he walks with me. Th follow me on this. In Genesis, God was with his people as he walked with them and as he talked with them in the garden. You go to the book of Exodus and you find that God then dwells with his people in the tabernacle. After Israel sins and the rebellion of the nation of Israel, God chooses to dwell in the temple. You can go to 1 Kings and 2 Kings. You can find where he dwells. And then, then you have the point where God is manifested in the flesh and he dwells among his people. And did the people receive him when he came? They crucified him. Now, God dwells with his people. How, church? In you and me. And the church, how many understand the church is not the building? The church is the people. And he dwells in each and every one of you. He inhabits you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. How many understand God has every right to command and instruct his people when he's paid for it all on the cross? God can't tell me what to do. He has every right to do it. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are who? God's. I don't know about you, but I love his church. I love the citizens of his church. Red, yellow, black, and white. How many know they're all precious in his sight? <laughs> That's the best part. One of the best parts. It's, it, it speaks of identification. It speaks of unity. Then we see the construction that the apostles and the prophets, they stood boldly for the gospel. They stood boldly for the coming Messiah to bring that to you and to me. Boy, you ought to thank the Lord that there were people that stood for that. We didn't even touch on the surface of the Great Reformation and the uh, revivals that took place. Whether in Europe or whether here stateside, there were people that died for the faith that we have. And they did so for the foundation, Jesus Christ himself. And the whole purpose of it is that we would be a holy temple and that God would, be the God would be able to inhabit you and me. Here's my question. If all of us this morning are the church because we're the people and God dwells in you and God dwells in me, can I ask you this? What does he see? Because I can tell you this. God sees everything you see. God hears everything you hear. God watches everything we do. How's our temple this morning? I'm thankful for the Gospel Light Baptist Church, but without the people, Gospel Light Baptist Church would be nothing. And without God, this place would be nothing. You ought to walk out of these doors this morning saying, thank you, God, for the local New Testament church. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, what a wonderful passage of Scripture. Lord, I thank you for this time that we've been able to open your word and study it and Lord, I pray that we've not opened it, that we've not studied it just for the say-so. But God, that we would open the word of God, we would study it, and that we would leave the book changed. Whether it's greater appreciation for the church, whether it's evaluating our faithfulness to the church, whether we're even a citizen of his body, if we're saved, heads bowed, eyes closed. There's nobody looking around this morning, but how many would say this morning, Pastor Scott, God forbid, God forbid,